So everybody, uh, welcome to our weekly uh, seminar. Today we have the pleasure to have uh, Dr. Andrei Lubano with us. Uh, so briefly about uh, Andrei, is uh, Andrei is a staff researcher in the VLBI group of the Max Planck Institute of Radio Astronomy in Bonn since 1998, and he's also a visitor scientist at the University of, uh, of Hamburg. Andre has uh, extensive expertise in both theoretical and observational studies of Arctic galaxies, uh, but and uh, he was also involved in many ground-based and space LBI project, uh, and in this regard, he was also the supervisor together with uh, Dr. Eduardo Ross of our very own Felix uh, Um but since AGN and VBI are not the only topics uh, Dr. Lobano is an expert about, today he will talk us about other interesting projects he's involved in at the University of Hamburg, project which had to deal with experiments for direct detection of uh, that matter. So that's what we can do. Thank you, Camilla. Thank you for in inviting me and giving me a chance to speak about my second uh, Ivastasi, right? <laughs> Of the uh, what what I do since um, a few years ago, since about fifteen years ago, uh, we started to look at the possibilities of uh, actually bringing the uh, uh, radio astronomical tools um, to some sort of a synergy with the experiments to uh, look for direct dark matter detections or using the uh, radio astronomy to uh, look for uh, uh, these exotic particles, which are supposed to be <clears throat> or maybe part of the dark matter. And I was just trying to impress mostly myself with this Lagrangian standard model and adding some things which are not explained by this standard model. And most of those are actually involved in some sort of a, uh, new particles and new forces which people are looking for. And somehow it doesn't move on. You know. Yes, yeah. So the standard model gives us almost everything in life, although it has a, has a lot of wheels, as you saw in this Lagrangian. I would I'll be scared to look at that uh, in, in details in all these terms. Um, but it doesn't explain several things which are actually equally important or very important. For instance, the um, neutral dipole, uh, electric dipole moment or lack of it of the neutron. Um, dark matter, dark energy, neutrino oscillations, strong CP problems. You just start naming that list of problems which which is going beyond the standard model, and that means that you need to uh, we need to uh, find some sort of its extensions, some solutions, and most of the solutions which are proposed to for this extension, and in most of them involve some sort of a se sector which is routinely called hidden sector, which is only very weakly coupled to normal matter. So basically, um, at best, for instance, if you're talking about dark matter, you would the dark, dark matter. You want to this particular carrier of that phenomenon to be coupled mostly gravitation or only gravitation. If it's coupled only gravitation, we will really at loss. We cannot detect it by except for except for indirect evidence, like in galactic rotation curves or something. But if we expected to be coupled at least weekly to some um, known standard model, model particles or forces and we uh, try to we can try to use this particle or forces as messengers uh, and to uh, and to understand the nature of, of this phenomenon dark matter of dark energy uh, we need to usually introduce new particles to explain uh, things like strong cp problems uh, some issues with neutrino oscillations um, and introduce new models to uh, explain quantum gravitation, quantum gravity, fine tuning is still required for many aspects of standard models. So all of those things basically tell us that we're not complete and maybe we actually, I, I sometimes like to bring this issue or this, this analogy, maybe we're doing the same things as Ptolemyus was doing by adding, by adding new epicycles to explain the uh, the positions of planets even better, ever better than before. Maybe some of these ideas that we're discussing now will turn out to be just epicycles. Uh, but this is this is how the progress should be still done, which is which is trying to understand the things. At some point, some directions we end up in a blind alley, so we just take another direction. 
So if you talk to people who study axions, work on axions or work on weak, weak interacting particles, so you sometimes get the feeling that you're coming close to the being in a blind alley. So the desperation, level of desperation of that field uh, only matches by level of optimism in, in inventing new and, and novel experiments to uh, detect the axions. So these are two bubbling things and people are quite, quite desperate at uh, more than 50 or 60 years of non detecting not just not just the axions, not detecting any dark matter carrying particles, of course, but uh, but equally you come to any meetings and dedicated to this kind of um, science, and is on every meeting there's yet another five or six whatever and new ideas how to how to measure them, particles, how to de detect axions, detect new particles of forces, and now you start see see this kind of desperation not only. Um, um, on the level of like looking for axioms, but also for level of looking for uh, standard model extensions, which you could be find in uh, in accelerators or at high energy. And many of these communities, including the LHC, including CERN, they are starting looking for experiments at low energies, which were like inconceivable for them. They will be not interested in doing these kind of things. At best, what they were, at least one to my knowledge, what CERN was doing until now was doing something in the X-rays with with cast, uh, trying to detect axions in the X-ray regime. This was the, as low as they could allow themselves to fall with respect to accelerated true accelerated science. Now they are looking for even the axion experiments in the radio regime. So they're really trying to uh, expand their horizons in terms of going from accelerated science to uh, and massive wimps, which are detected usually in the underground detectors um, uh, doing the scattering experiment. They want to sub EV regime where the mass or the energy of the particles will fall much below one electron volt. So, this is because of the say, lack of detection of massive particles, which could be dark matter carrier, and lack of um, new science coming from the accelerators. So, that's how, that's how these. Attention shifted, or more the focus of that attention goes more and more to these micro electron volts, mini electron volts regimes, which is good for us, good for the people doing radio astronomy or the radio. That's the typical regime of uh, radio and, and some millimeter measurements, gigahertz and terahertz. So, this is how, but at least for me, this is well, how. Excuse me, what yeah. are dark photons? Dark photons, uh, I'm just going to do. Okay. This, uh, yes. So let me just say the two candidates which which uh, I'm going to be discussing more. This first of all, the first one is the famous axiom, which was um, invented or proposed to uh, try to explain the uh, known problem of uh, QCD, namely the QCD predicts certain um, electric dipole moment of the of a neutron, which is measured to be essentially zero or maybe to about much smaller than, than this value, 10 to minus 11, but that's almost 11 orders of magnitude or several orders of magnitude smaller than the predicted value. So the idea is that you just add some sort of a um, new symmetry breaking at a specific scale, which should dynamically take that parameter theta to zero or reduce it to, to, to zero. And the idea, the original idea had to be modified because the original axiom, you know, the original symmetry breaking was quickly um, excluded. But then people soon realize, after let's say two Nobel Prizes, realized that this A should imply a new particle in this description. And that particle then started to be more and more popular for not just for explaining the problem with the QCD. But also as a, as a very viable candidate for dark matter. So the idea for detecting axiom is basically just look at its potential coupling with uh, photons. It's a two photon vertex here, so you can spontaneously uh, axiom can spontaneously decay in these two photons. And in experiments, you can substitute one of those photons with the uh, static magnetic field, which uh, basically uh, acts as a virtual photon. So that's what you do for the experiments. You put the magnetic field instead of this photon, and you detect, try to detect the photon which you expect from this from this decay. For the uh, the further developments of theories, and especially of uh, 
string theories, they um, require a similar type of particles, which I would not be um, fixed to a specific scale of this uh, symmetry violation. So they, therefore, they would not have a very uh, a similar relation, relation between that scale and the mass of the particles. That's why they were called axial light particles. They are similar in behavior, similar in uh, in their roles in their in in their models, but they do not have a very strict uh, mass constraints imposed on the on the axon. So these are two uh, type of particles which which are very actively searched for uh, for the purpose of uh, basically vilifying the um, string uh, model string theory models, uh, looking for QCD uh, um, model explanation for this uh, neutron uh, electric mm -hmm. dark of, of the neutron and looking for them as the viable dark uh, matter candidate and that's the uh, uh, the amount of experiments uh, the amount of parameter space probed by different type of experiments over the last say, 50, 50 years and you see the year uh, you go from 10 to minus 12 ev to 10 to 7 ev and even uh, larger energies, so 20, 20 orders of magnitude in, in terms of particle energy people try to probe. And that's uh, yellow band here. This is the holy grail of, uh, of the axion itself, of the QCD axion. That's where you expect it to be, um, except since you do not find it between these two strict lines of the two different models, People just try to explain, explain expand the parameters. So there's, there's some, the band, which is not so... Uh, well defined, it's like a fuzzily defined defined band, and that's what you expect the true axion or the QCD axion, axion that deals with the QCD uh, problematics to be found. The Alps, the axion like particles can be um, in a much larger and much less sort of um, poorly defined areas of this parameter space while still explaining the uh, dark matter properties. And those are different types of experiments, and you see there's some labels like x-rays, extra galactic background, light, um, <laughs> big bang nuclear synthesis, and all the astrophysical um, uh, effects we're trying to use to constrain the properties of the particles. There's also uh, like supernova Fermi measurements, and these are direct detection experiments, neutron stars and solar, and solar neutrinos and everything else. So almost every astrophysical measurement now of any source will be used the week after you published it, so to constrain, to try to constrain one of those particles, including the EHT, including whatever you did. There. So this is a that shows the uh, the level of interest, but also the level of I would say the level of desperation in trying to um, find this particle. So dark or hidden photons were produced in introduced originally soon after the um, neutron and neutrino oscillations were discovered, because people start thinking that photons should have a similar property. Of oscillating between normal and sterile states. So neutrino oscillates between normal state and sterile states in which it weakly interacts and not interacting with the uh, with normal matter. So the idea was that the um, the symmetries which are involved in standard model, they uh, the breaking of those symmetries would also involve photon going from normal state, which is massless, but interacting with the with the matter into a sterile state in which the photon acquires mass. And become but becomes hidden in terms of actually interacting with the with the normal matter. So that's that's why they were called hidden or dark dark photons. And then they said the this idea was become very useful and popular for uh, string theories because that's where you uh, you use this kind of symmetries for compactifying the strings which you needed for in most of the theory uh, theories. And that would also produce some what you call the natural bounds for uh, what kind of um, coupling or what kind of intent uh, magnitude of coupling for between normal and the hidden photons should be. Um, if we want to want it to be a part of the dark matter, then there's a little bit more uh, stringent constraints here. So this is depending on the. Uh, um, the formation mechanism for these for these hidden photons. That's what the typical area of um, coupling and mass of the hidden photon that you would expect for it to be a good candidate for cold dark matter. And here, what we see also is 
the number of experiments now this plot is updated or can be updated um, but also as you can also see the variety or range of on the magnitude of um, mass scale which have been probed by different different experiments and that's what radio does here in laboratory and in space because because in astronomy um, there's interesting fact that the mass probed by astronomical measurements in that consideration the distance to the object also comes into uh, as a factor so essentially for the high range of objects or for the object with larger distances and low frequencies you go you extend to much more masses so this is the two particular particles there are more candidates there are like uh, particles like chameleons which are supposed to be explaining dark energy milli charge particles gravity ions get it on so, so a lot of spe other species are also sometimes or often explored by these experiments but the two most most prominent candidates for most prominent targets for all the experiments are these axions and uh, dark or hidden photons. Yes. Are these dark or hidden photons uh, being hypothesized or we have detected one of them? <laughs> we will be celebrating. Like, no, no, this is all. All of this, all of these are just exclusion limits. People, it's essentially non detection experiments, all of them. It's just people. Not detecting, not detecting the real uh, evidence for this hidden photon. From this no detection, you just make some inferences of what kind of couplings it it implies. So if you say from the CMB measurements, if the hidden photons at mass ten to minus twelve eV and the coupling coupling of about ten to minus three, you should be detected in a CMB signal, but we don't, and that's why that's why we just put this shaded area here there's no detection no unfortunately for any of those particles not just for hidden photons for axions for chameleon milli charge band, you name it there's no detection of any particle beyond standard model yet okay. so and this is what the usually uh, type of experiments what you're done for the, for looking for this type of part kind of particles laboratory experiments Basically, you generate a photon beam and generate conditions into this into which this photon beam could be converted into one of those exotic particles. For instance, for, for axions, you introduce magnetic field, and essentially this is a laser beam hitting the wall, and then you get, get another cavity with, my, with magnetic field, where you expect that if some of these photons and the influence of magnetic fields would be converting themselves into the axions. They would, these axions would fly through the wall, but they would not fill the barrier. And then with the same probability, they could be converted to a photon. So this is a, a standard so-called light shining through the wall type of experiments. And that's one of those done um, successfully in terms of uh, performing, but not successfully in terms of detecting. Uh, the particle is done in Hamburg. I will <laughs> show the results of it a bit later. There's a lot of astrophysical searches based on the propagation effects. So you, again, if you expect that this photon conversion of, uh, of this weakly interacting particles occurs spontaneously for hidden photons or under <clears throat> in the present <throat> magnetic field for axions or maybe several other particles, what's going to happen is that your <clears throat> astrophysical spectrum from a source. If you know this, your sources have parallel spectrum. But if uh, if there is wisp conversion occurs during the propagation, then your parallel spectrum will be modified, and you can look for this modification. For instance, this is what you expect from uh, from hidden photons. Instead of a parallel or some uh, curved parallel, you would have some oscillations introduced by, into the spectrum due to this. Uh, Oscillation between normal and hidden photon state. So you can look for this oscillation. You can look for some, uh, for instance, gamma ray transparency of the universe. We do not know why gamma rays, we detect gamma ray sources at the redshift of one, because well, from what we understand, they, these gamma rays should be absorbed. So one of the ideas is that these gamma rays during their propagation, they convert into some fraction of it into axions, and that's how they reach. Um, the observers because there's the reconversion so essentially it's like a light shining through the wall experiments in the universe they convert into axions propagate through large chunks of the uh, universe and then they reconvert back to photons in the galactic magnetic field so this is the idea for 
this type of uh, at least explanation research is yes what's the period of this uh, conversion oh it depends on the uh, mass. on depends on the mass it's like yes in neutrinos okay right right depends on the mass and uh, um the probability also depends on the on the magnetic field for axions but for, for hidden photons it's dependent on primarily on the mass so so you look for modifications of astrophysical spectrum which should be or could be explained by by this by these effects of this conversion uh in some settings the same uh couplings of this uh, weakly interrupted particles should be should be um leading to their production for instance the most expected effect is that the same what they call the primal co effect as two photon conversion of axions the reverse of it the inverse primal co effect should be uh or the expected uh, effect of it is the production of axions in the interior of the sun and the strong conditions in strong magnetic fields and strong large densities so in this case we would expect um, photons the axions of the energies of corresponding to x-ray x-ray um, energies will be reaching the earth and then you can detect them in the same settings by by in, in inducing magnetic field introducing magnetic field and producing photons from that uh, reconversion of the axions so this is the idea of one of the uh, experiments which was run at uh, CERN the cast experiment looking for x-ray photons from that reconversion of axions produced in the sun so they run it for many years produced again just exclusion limits and the next idea is to uh, build a larger experiment called the axon international axion observatory uh, to uh, uh, improve these limits further well all detect of course the, the, the ultimate goal is the detection so astrophysical searches can also introduce or include the settings where the uh, we the dark matter particles produced of, made of this weakly interacting slim or sub weakly particles enters the settings of the year where you where you have ultra strong magnetic fields for instance near neutron stars or near Christian Christian distant black holes so that's the idea explored by uh, several uh, measurements you try to look for this signal uh, in terms of next to the uh, neutron star with the dark matter axions where they flow and enter the strong magnetic field region and next to the neutron star they should convert themselves according to uh, our expectation to convert themselves into uh, radio photons or photons which you can detect in the second plot the uh broadband spectra what is is the bottom axis i cannot read oh no, sorry this is t this, this is the energy energy t in TEVs. energy in what in tvs that's T V. yeah but that could be true for um it could be used or explored in in the entire electromagnetic spectrum it depends on the, only depend the range at which this modification occurs only depends on the expected mass of the particle so um some of these things some of the well this is this is for instance earth and jupiter that's so that's a modification of radio spectrum of radio measurements so this is a it could be a, not necessarily limited to a high energy it's just an example and then finally that's what the laboratory dark matter search is it it's the attempts to directly detect the uh, conversion of uh, axions or dark matter light dark matter entering laboratories so if if the dark matter that we expect is composed of these particles they of course penetrate everything including this this room and the occupation number um of of these particles is huge in fact and the de Broglie wavelength is large because if you if you think about particles with the uh, um, energies of less than one electron volts the de Broglie length becomes very sizable so maybe sometimes well it's of the order of several meters for micro electron volts so that's and even larger for the for lower lower masses so this part this type of dark matter becomes what they call a wavy or wave dark matter so essentially behaves like a like a coherent wave and then you basically you produce that you put introduce a detection apparatus and you detect the uh, try to detect the uh, signal which 
would be produced by dark matter converting into photons in that inside your laboratory, inside your detection apparatus. And this is just an example. That's a present day or the world map of the uh, different type of WISP experiments, including some of the uh, some of the familiar faces like PTA, pulse timing array, we also try to that doing astrophysical searches are constrained on the on the dark on on mm -hmm. actually on dark matter as well. Scalar that matters here. LIGO, you can find a lot of VLT. So you see SPT, BICEP, SKA, S, MAGIC, all familiar uh, through physical facilities have been tried to uh, be using them. And some of those are just dedicated experiments. And that's the uh, experiments that we do in, in Hamburg with, with GMX, with called C, ships, with Clyde, Mad Max, Alps, Yaxo, Brass. Hamburg has become essentially one of the hub of, of several experiments um, which would have been done or will be done in, in search for this light um, mass dark matter. So yep. they, how, how is LIGO searching for this? Is it the same thing? Well, uh, this is the scalar vector. They, they can do, they can constraints so basically some the generic, generic, matter. Generic, generic dark matter, not so specifically associated with one of these two particles. So this, but uh, again, very long wavelength. Uh, very yes, wavelength. yes. So same same principle as the pulsar diamond arrays? In principle, yes. That's a, So you see LIGO and um, this Gale, Gale 600, that's yeah. the uh, ANOVA measurements. And uh, lines and microscope tell us things that basically you don't for generic type of scalar or vector particles. They cannot tell you much about the uh, what kind of particle it should be. So this is what we do or what is what, how you do look for dark matter, with dark matter in the radio regime. So what is known there is that you basically emerge in dark matter halo and this dark matter halo will produce then a signal which would be um, essentially proportional to the velocity dispersion of the dark matter squared, so 10 to minus 6. So frequency bandwidth of that signal will be about 10 to minus 6 fractional, fractional bandwidth of the signal. So you look for something which is like a weak and narrow line in on the, on the, on the background which you measure in your laboratory experiment. So. Uh, hidden photons or axions entering your laboratory experiment will convert themselves into photons, and the energy dis dis dispersion of the, those photons will be proportional to the velocity dispersion of the dark matter halo in the galaxy. And why the radio regime becomes uh, more and more interesting for this type of experiments, you can basically guess from, from this diagram. So these are all constraints obtained from, this is from EXO and uh, solar um, axions detection and non-detection. That's constraints coming from these experiments, from solar neutrino white bars. Mm -hmm. You see they all come up here at the level of about 10 to minus two uh, electron volts or about two terahertz or point wavelengths of point, uh, point 0.1 millimeter. And here, the strong theoretical uh, constraints come into the play. So you basically, if you want to want your axion dark matter to be lower, small, much, much smaller than 10 to minus 7 electron volts, you start facing various model constraints or model problems from, from, from the theory. And also from the point of view of occupation number, there's a number of particles in square, in cubic centimeter becomes an, an uncomfortably large for all the small masses. This is one of the ranges which has already been probed very sensitive, sensitively with these two experiments in 10 to minus 5, but uh, uh, about 10 to minus 5 EV. But all of that area is pretty much empty. And from the point of view of theory, it's also pretty much interesting then for, for, for the uh, to be a uh, area for where axions could be a candidate can be good candidates for for the dark matter and that's why radio measurements become more and more um, popular in this uh, regime and the main idea here uh, for looking for 
axions or hidden photons is again we look for the for the photon coupling and you look for detecting this power in a narrow line with with this particular output power output which is proportional to the um, coupling of the particle to your um, to the photons volume of the experiments and square of the magnetic field and in this case the factor of q which is the resonant enhancement used in a cavity so this is one of the pop most popular uh, setup for these measurements you um, build a cavity which is highly resonant to um, a specific at a specific frequency and um, your signal which is produced by incoming axions electromagnetic signal is then resonantly enhanced by the by this factor of q the bulk of the year the downside of that is that the bandwidth of your measurements is also becomes reduced by this by the same factor. So if you want to scan over the uh, range of energies, range of masses, you have to make your cavity tunable. But you also have to make many tuning steps. steps. So the experiment, which I was shown in the previous plot, the ADMX, it took them several years to complete um, just a few gigahertz. No, no, it's less than, less, less than gigahertz. Um, of uh, measurements in, in bandwidth. So this is a problem here. You have, you have very good sensitivity, which is enhanced by a factor of Q, so which could be 10 to 4, 10 to 5 easily, but you need equally number of steps, essentially, several thousand steps to, to cover um, a sensitive, sensible uh, range of energies or frequencies. The idea that we try to explore in in a broadband setup was the uh, proposal that actually use uh, a surface which would be either immersed into uh, into magnetic fields or permanently magnetized magnetized by itself and then you focus the signal which is should be produced by uh, incoming axions you can just focus it on the uh, on the receiver in this case you can do a broadband detection yes um so I'm a little confused. So you say that so the conversion depends on the Q of the cavity, right? So well, the conversion is not the, well. The, the action photon conversion should not depend on the Q. No, 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 no. It, the signal, your detection, detection. Okay, fine, fine. Yes. So you, you enhance the electromagnetic uh, signal from the conversion. But the, okay, but the conversion itself is it does not depend on the Q. It does not depend on having a cavity or not, right? Yeah. No. Okay. No, the conversion itself is is only. Is only determined by these factors. Okay. So plus, I, the, plus the volume there. I Q means that we don't lose the photons. You yes. take some more of this. Yes. Exactly. Right. Okay. right. Okay. It just uh, it just leaves longer in, in your cavity. Okay. So, you so, you, okay. so that's essentially what it is. So um so in this case, we lose the Q, the Q becomes unity, but we gain um uh, with the surface. Because so you can make this surface much much bigger than the cavity. The cavity has to be always um, the size of the cavity, always proportional to the uh, to the wavelengths that you uh, measure, resonantly measure with this cavity. So essentially, if you go to the higher energies, shorter wavelengths, the size of the cavity becomes much smaller. But then you start losing the factor of volume of your of your experiment. And that's that means that this achieve to achieve high sensitivity at uh, uh, shorter wavelengths becomes more and more difficult even for the uh, for these cavities. So for short wavelengths, this type of experiment, this one that type of detection becomes more and more interesting. But also what I wanted to say uh, earlier is that this is inherently broadband thing. You you are not limited to any resonant conditions here. You could do it in, in at any frequency. Which essentially only determined by the, uh, the range of accessible frequency, only determined by the size of this uh, conversion surface at low at uh, low frequency or long wavelengths, and by the accurate surface accuracy at high frequency. So you basically can build this setup and can use it at the range of frequency from frequencies from one gigahertz to several terahertz. Would be one and the same experiment you only change the uh, the detector and if you do that if you want to do it in this microwave cavity setup you would have to build many many cavities and then at one terahertz the cavities become see it's, it's no longer feasible because 
the wavelengths are less than one millimeter, so the cavity should be of the same of the same size, essentially. So these are two concepts which have been explored. This one is traditionally used, and now several we started uh, exploiting, exploiting this one in with our experiments in Hamburg, and now it's going to be uh, tried in several different incarnations and different uh, different places. What I wanted to uh, um, emphasize here is that again, if we talk about hidden photons, the factor of b squared disappears, and the only the only important factor remains is essentially the uh, volume of the cavity and um, resonance factor or the, the uh, surface area of your experiment if you talk about broadband detections. And again, it, when you're talking about broadband detection, this is a great synergy with heterodyne detections in radio astronomy. What we do with the uh, LBI, go into uh, many gigahertz bandwidths and tremendous spectral resolution, which is now accessible uh, to us, can only be can very nicely used for these type of experiments. So this is what uh, searches in the radio domain uh, cover now, or that and have been covering until until present. So this is the ADMX experiment, which was doing the most sensitive searches called QCD axions, and that's a several experiments. Some of us, which we are developing or developed, is this Swiss PMX, Brass, Wispel C, and Mud Max. They're all experiments are done in Hamburg covering this kind of different ranges of uh, frequencies and read different ranges of um, uh, axial mass. And that yellow band again shows the most interesting domain from the point of view of several hints or ideas from the theoretical point for, point for uh, point of view and from the uh, hints which is called from coming from the uh, uh, white dwarfs pulling uh, times because they are, seem to be favoring some, this kind of um, axions presence or axions with, with this type of uh, Masses. So that's why several experiments are trying to reach into the into this area of uh, parameter space. So now let me just quickly go through the uh, other experiments which are done in Hamburg. This is Alps. This is the light shining through the wall, which I mentioned before. You shot shine a photon beam, laser beam through um, a cavity. With highly resonant, highly resonant cavity for and um, submerge this cavity into magnetic field, expecting that that axion conversion would occur in one side of this uh, setup, and then the axions would travel through that barrier in the middle in to another part of this setup and be reconverted into photons um, to be detected later. In, in that side of the uh, apparatus. And that first incarnation of this experiment has been run for several years, completed in 2010. And that's the, uh, the, uh, the exclusion limits which they are able to obtain there. You see this Alps one in comparison to uh, several other experiments which are actually came, came around later. So the second um, stage of this experiment are being built now. They increased it from some sort of uh, 12 meters to about 100 meters. So by increasing by uh, the sensitivity by several orders of magnitude, and that's what you the expected sensitivity of there. And that's the first results. Maybe this is what you were alluding to. Somebody who was saying that first results from should be should be coming out from one of the experiments in Hamburg. This was just. Uh, preliminary sensitivity from a test run that they did last last year they not published it it's just basically a very much preliminary expectation uh, from those measurements so is that the projected sensitivity this is the projected sensitivity of the full thing they, are, they have not completed the uh, the full um, um refurbishing of that of this of this cavities yet and there is also another thing is that um to reduce the sensitivity, you, you need to uh, do a lot of stabilization and phase locking of the lasers on both sides of, the, of this. Um, 
process. So that's uh, still um, a work to be done on their part. So what we've done, we've done um, starting about 2012 uh, was what I call the cheapest particle physics or action experiment ever done because we just used um, a second hand accelerator cavity, which was applied to accelerate protons. So essentially for, for that, it was uh, operated with a resonant frequency of 208 uh, megahertz. We built, we took this cavity with the idea of uh, building up a tunable apparatus here. There's two tuners allowing us to tune um, the resonant modes to um, within about 20, 30% of frequency. And the idea was to essentially, at some point, to put this cavity in the bore of a very large magnet, uh, the H1 magnet um, it, it operated at DAISY. That last part did not happen because DAISY uh, decided not to operate this magnet anymore. And so we could only use this cavity for um, trying to detect hidden photons, which do not require a magnetic field. And first thing that was done without tuning, you see this nettle, it's just like in needles. That's the resonant modes of the several resonant modes of this of this cavity. And then we implemented tuning. The tuning allowed us a little bit expand these needles into some uh, ranges here. But the broadband detection, which which could be used uh, uh, with this cavity, allowed us essentially to build this or cover that the entire area of uh, of the parameter space of the mass. And unfortunately, again. We could not detect any uh, any sensible signal. There was a uh, there was a candidate. There was a particular candidate um, signal which looked just exactly like like the dark matter a signal should look like, which is a Maxwellian distribution. If you calculate the intensity of the signal, the width of the signal, and the location of the signal, it was coming up somewhere here. Uh, where nothing was excluded, it would be it would be perfectly okay from the point of view of becoming being, being a dark matter signal from the hidden photons. But unfortunately, it disappeared after we tried to measure it. So with some some sort of electronic uh, conspiracy um, from the cables or I don't know what. But this is the uh, the name of the game in in this in this regard because if you detect something which you think is uh, is coming from dark matter, that signal should should surely stay and not only it should stay it should have uh, particular signatures throughout the year because since the dark matter signal depends on the uh, velocity with which the dark matter enters enters your apparatus it will change because of the orbital velocity of the earth it will also change because of the rotation of the earth so you could look for for all kinds of modulations of that signal and that would be a our attempt to do we will, that will be we be doing if that signal persisted for some time. Well, maybe it will be rediscovered because this apparatus leaves now as the uh, as a student practical uh, assignment. So the students come and measure. They try to measure. We don't tell them where, but they are trying to look for for this kind of for dark matter signal with this apparatus. Uh, but no success yet as well. So. So there are several others, um, other experiments, other ideas which have been pursued. Um, this one is um, a similar idea to um, cavity, the resonant uh, cavity, but instead of the cavity, you use uh, an LC circuit, which in the same settings, if the axion is entering this magnetic field, um, um, bore of the of the magnet, and then one of the uh, parts of this bore is actually embraced by by this LC circuit. You should generate uh, a current here in that circuit because the axions axion can would would generate the displacement current, which will be then generating essentially a current in the inside the circuit. And if you calculate what what kind of uh, uh, current you expect, it will be proportional to the coupling constant of the Axion to photon conversion magnetic field in the in 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 this magnet and the, this volume essentially of this. So the prediction is that you could actually uh, try to do quite 
uh, swaths of this uh, parameter space with these measurements because we have a, a pretty strong magnet. This is like a, a portion test on magnet operating in no cool conditions, so you don't need to cool it. But this area, this volume here, is strongly magnetized. So essentially, that's something which which will be done in the near future. We will try to uh, start this this kind of measurements. The uh, other type of experiments, and I told you, is that you come to any me meeting, and this is you see 20, 20 new ideas or five new ideas. This is one of those. Uh, it's the same thing, but 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 instead of the cavity, you use the uh, fibers, and as the fiber is put in the uh, in the magnetic field in the ambient magnetic field, and you shoot the photon beam, the photon through the through this fiber. Some of those photons should, technically speaking, convert themselves into axions if axions actually exist and behave like we expect them to behave. And then you create what we, what we do this called the mark tender the parameter which would we'd be able to detect the difference between these two beams one going through the uh, magnetic field one not and then you will detect the difference in the amplitude and, and some phase um, uh, between these two beams so you can actually make this kind of measurements and and try to detect the um, actual signal in terms of disappearance of the photons which should which go through this magnetized part of the uh, of the fiber is is no nothing to do with the uh, with dark matter and this is just basically detecting axions if it was just just a QCD thing and not not part of the dark matter so that's what what you expect to do that's a, a bit um, it's a small part of the uh, parameter space you can tune this tune this experiment by essentially um, filling with a fiber with gas which changes the uh, Refraction index, and so, so you can basically um, try to work on this thing. That's the uh, exploratory thing that we uh, we try, and again using that powerful magnet of of the fourteen Tesla. So this is uh, things in the future. There is one particularly well. There are two. The next two experiments which I will mention. They are both um, use that dish. Concept is uh, a magnetized um, surface concept, and one of them is uh, called Magmax, in which the magnetization is actually this is the whole bore of of the instrumentum, and you get the uh, axial conversion conversion inside this inside this bore, and then. Uh, in addition to that, you try to enhance the signal by a very uh, interesting technique. You just basically space there are several a large number of dielectric discs, space them at the uh, equal separations, and then the uh, incoming electric field, because of the uh, phase displacements here inside the dielectrics, could be actually enhanced by by this uh, regular arrangement of the discs that's been shown to be uh, to be working you can get a boosting factor by of about 100 at the expense again of essentially uh, folding your measurement domain to a uh, much not no, to a not necessarily a very broad broadband measurements but you can introduce up to 80 discs that's the their idea of putting up to 80 uh, the electric disc in such a, such an apparatus and then generating axions, electromagnetic signal from axion passages inside this apparatus and focusing it on the um, onto the, the detector. It's a very expensive undertaking, as it turns out to be, because there's a huge volume, and then they want to have about 10 Tesla magnetic field in this volume. This, this such magnets are very difficult to build and very expensive. So they hold um Cost of this experiment are now uh, slowly exploding to about up to about 100 million euros, and I'm not sure when and how it's going to be built. But the uh, idea is is very noble because that is the uh, goal and the expectation for the sensitivity of these of full scale experiments, and that's that again that's that golden band of the QCD axiom. So you should be able to pull a very large range of mass, almost an order of magnitude. And down to a very uh, distance sensitivity. So, we're doing this in a 
um, down to the QCD limits. It's a difficult experiment. So I said when I was saying before that we the max that we try was the cheapest uh, particle physics experiments that costs about hundred thousand euros altogether. So the, the, the most expensive part was just these two tuners, which were built for, for the experiments. The rest was essentially uh, recycled. Thank you. you. You have to build anything, everything from scratch, and even placing these magnetic disks and um, at equal separations, and then using them to cha change the separation to tune uh, the apparatus becomes very, very challenging undertaking because these things should be mechanically operated in the same Tesla magnetic field. So any motors, uh, anything that goes there has to be designed in such a way that it would not, would not break down or uh, would, be, would be still operating under 10 Tesla conditions. So it's not an easy uh, thing from many points of view. And finally, that the experiments which uh, we are mostly doing, oh, it's, it's called brass, and the idea is there is to uh, uh, create a setup which would be useful or usable in a very broad range of frequencies from about one gigahertz to more than one terahertz. And so essentially you could just basically substitute or change the receivers, change the detectors working in all of this domain and use the same one and the same apparatus uh, to uh, cover all this range of uh, frequencies or masses. And those are different particular aspects of uh, theoretical models predicting sweet spots, so-called sweet spots for, for uh, um, axion as a dark matter carrier. So we will be covering most of these things or all of these uh, particular things, particular predictions or expectations, including some of the hints from some the astrophysical measurements where people still start thinking that they see some signals from uh, from this axiom. So we propose it for uh, GFG funding in Germany, and uh, it was not successful on the first proposal. Then we started building a prototype with our own with our own strengths. But the uh, final idea looks like this. So we want to have permanently magnetized surface, which would be used for uh, to to produce the electric signal when the axial or hidden photon is passing through the uh, passing through this um, surface. So this signal then would be emitted perpendicularly to that surface and focused by, by the parabolic reflector into this receiver model, module. And in order to achieve a, a decent sensitivity, we need to make it relatively big. So essentially we need to have diameter of this reflector of about eight meters and not just one but two this connecting the two such chambers of eight meters in diameter so it's not uh, also not the most easiest configuration which you can build uh, but it is it is possible and it is not um, as expensive as one might expect so basically the, the estimates for the uh, entire cost of this experiment will be on the order of 10. 10 million, 10 million million euros. So what we did first is to um, start with prototyping uh, for the um, magnetic surface. And it turns out essentially for, you can basically build a permanent magnet of 1.2 Tesla in strength in the room conditions out of other blocks which will be shipped to you. And uh, this is how it looks. That's one Tesla magnet sort of magnetized surface. And uh, essentially, you arrange those magnets in such a configuration that you create a parallel magnetic field of the strength of about 0 0 0 0.9, 0 0.9 Tesla. So this is where your dark matter accidents enter, enter these apparatus, and they convert themselves in at about height proportional to the, uh, the wavelengths or the mass of the axions here. And then essentially you create um, electric, electric, electromagnetic signal emanated from, from this type of surface. So what we did then, we basically built a, a prototype which has a 2.5 meters 
uh, emitting <clears throat> surface and 2.5 meters uh, reflector here. And then there's a detector in the, in the focal uh, um, plane of the uh, this of this reflector. And we're using standard uh, with astronomical detection mechanism for digitizing the signal brought by digitization of the signal. So we digitize four gigahertz of bandwidth at the resolution down to 20 hertz. So 20 hertz resolution over the entire four gigahertz bandwidth. So you should basically can then detect all these narrow lines um, anywhere in within that um, within that band. So magnetic panels are now arrived and they're going to be, going to be installed very soon uh, in place of these aluminum panels. The aluminum panels, since they're not magnetized, they can only be used for, for essentially, we would expect that only the heat photons would, would uh, produce the electromagnetic signal passing through this through this uh, surface of these um, panels. So we can use that setup we use it for calibrating things and, and uh, testing it, several things. And we could use it for um, trying to detect signal from hidden photons. And then we can start using it for detecting signals from the maximums as soon as we replace these things with the magnetized panels. And this is the result from uh, using this for, for hidden photon detections. This is 55 hours of 4 gigahertz bandwidth from 12 gigahertz to 16 gigahertz. And then from essentially this 12, 16, and, and combined together with uh, 14 to 18 gigahertz. So 16, 6 gigahertz band of bandwidth uh, scanned with 20 hertz resolution. And you can basically um, estimate the sensitivity to the uh, hidden photon signal down to uh, this level because of the um, all of the candidate signals or suspicious signals which which we see over these bandwidths uh, uh, do not um, pass the criteria for uh, for being dark matter signals they either do not have a shape or the width which uh, should be coming from uh, a true dark matter signal so unfortunately no detection there are either and here basically what you can see is what we can do if we use the same setup, but as I said, you just substitute the receiver that we have now, working from 12 to 18 gigahertz. We will substitute with the standard receivers which are in operation on uh, Effelsberg telescope or for the Apex telescope and some of the other receivers as well. That use that. So this is the ranges of frequencies which we can uh, scan and the sensitivities which we can expect if we just use that. Uh, relatively primitive, primitive and easy, easy doing setup for hidden photon searches in in range of frequencies or range of mass of uh, more than two orders of two orders of magnitude. So this setup, then we now um, we're going to be exploiting for some time, and uh, after installing the uh, magnetic magnetic panels. That is what we expect to, to be achieving for, for the axion or help detections. We are not able, of course, to reach this golden band of the QCD axion, but uh, the sensitivity of that experiment of this of a prototype experiment will also exceed the sensitivity of uh, several other experiments working in the same range of uh, frequency. But then um, now the University of Hamburg builds a new building for the, uh, the natural sciences uh, departments. And that building is envisaging the uh, laboratory space for the full brass installations for this full two chambers of eight meters in, in size. So we start um, as soon as we get funding for, well, one of the, one of the chambers will be funded by by the department already and for the second one we would need to find funding from coming from the third party most likely from the uh, german science foundation the dfg so once we've done that um, this is the expectation what brass would be doing for hidden photon detections that's our with pmx results and brass goes all the way up and this is essentially brass p that's where we are on the measurements the measurements are a little bit 
higher than this expected curve. But that's but this is the um, the expectation for this full area of the experiment coming from two chambers. And you see it becomes very, very sensitive, the most sensitive in uh, measurements in, in the entire range of like almost four, three or four orders of magnitude in um in frequency or in mass in frequency. And for axions for Alps, the full brass becomes a competitive experiment reaching the uh, the QCD band. Um, but of course, that's at, at slightly sort of this is more difficult because this is what we uh, can achieve easily or more with some with some um, efforts. That's the uh, figure of merit for uh, axial detection square square of the uh, magnetic field times the area of the experiment. So if we have hundred Tesla square meter square, that's what the uh, what brass can achieve. This is what the sensitivity where we scratch that surface of the QCD axions, but we will be able to um, again do the entire range of that. So even if we do not um, achieve a great performance with respect to this QCD axion band, we will be able to cut most of the parameter space from uh, for the uh, axion like particles. So, future of brass should be a, a very interesting. Experiment at addressing both hidden photons and axions in more than three orders of magnitude of mass. So, results at least on hidden photons in the prototype, uh, but hidden photons are already there, and the prototyping for axions, ALPS, will be coming up soon. So, let me just um, finish all of this excursion and do these experiments that we're doing. And, uh, <clears throat> colleagues are doing in Hamburg is that the rate the range of the um, from radio to millimeter domain is very interesting from many points of view uh, or, or many uh, from many point of view for finding the uh, uh, dark matter carrier particle be it an action be it a hidden photon and the number of experiments can be performed in that in that regime of laboratory and then also there are lots of ideas uh, how to exploit it uh, through astrophysical measurements you can see some of those experiments are actually here shown in this uh, dashed lines, the expected coverage. So many of those we try to cover one and the same range. And the brass will cover the entire range, not maybe not uh, reaching the sensitivity of some of these experiments, but it will be very effective in looking for this particle over the entire range of this mass. And all of these experiments, they benefit very strongly from, from the synergy with radio astronomical developments because the um, gold band detection and heterodyne detection developments are, are, developing, are driven by, by the need of the new instruments in radio astronomy. And we, get, we expect several of them to improve in sensitivity in gold band uh, bandwidth and also in the uh, um, capacities of. Um, of uh, Spectral resolution. So the future here is will be very uh, very interesting for these type of measurements. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, maybe one two questions. Who's on the other list? Cloud from my son. So, what are the requirements for the mirrors, the eight meter uh, reflectors? Are they just uh, radio dishes? They're similar to all magicians. That's uh, well, requirements essentially um, depends on the way. Depends on the depends on the maximum largest way or short wavelengths that you want to uh, address. So, with this dish that we that we have for prototyping, we can go to uh, two terahertz without any problem. Where do you use uh, magicians on software in your field? So, for example, uh, our magicians are much more expensive because they're built for for um, um, operating for moving movable antennas, steerable antennas. This one is is fixed. So, this essentially this reflector is completely. Frozen, fixed. There. There's no that's not to, that's not to be moved. It's much, much, much cheaper. So we 
And we, we talk to the same people. This is the Vertex company that does the best. Um, how much do you gain if you pull your receivers or if you just operate them and throw them from the chip? Yes. In gain, of course, so, uh, quite a bit, but mostly from, from the point of view of, um, of the thermal radiation that, that hits your receiver. So the receiver is then um, Receiver sees, sees mostly the antenna. So the antenna is, technically speaking, cool from the point of view of the You get the uh, system temperature of, of this whole apparatus is of the order of 60, 70 K. Mm -hmm. But you, I mean, you're not looking at the sky, so. No, no, I, I wonder why, why do you have to do the, I mean, what we don't care if we're looking at food because it's a huge a lot of space. Let's go to it. And there the uh, radiation itself is not is not such a problem because you still you look on the uh, signal on top of the background. So that's what uh, what's important there. So what is important is that this there's no stray uh, radiation entering the receiver. So we have to we have to deal with the, uh, the illumination. And also, we will at some point, at some point, introduce here a star for um, like a fence around the uh, around the uh, reflector. So, yeah, so I can imagine that when you get the first spectrum of noise in the receiver, you will have several spurious candidates, right, to investigate. So, how many degrees of freedom do you have? You cannot have two experiments because it gets too messy, too complicated, too expensive, right? But, yes. How many degrees of freedom do we have to clean up the spectrum or investigate these candidates? Ah, I should have shown you that. This spectrum looks ugly. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's the spectrum uh, sees, we, you could see, you see everything. You see a lot of um, uh, electronic signals. You see clocks. That's very difficult to shield everything there. We try to remove almost everything from this room. It's shielded, but nevertheless, um, the level of detection, the stem to minus 21 watts, at this level, even signals enter through, through cables, and you see them as well. You, with the uh, old experiment, with BMX, inside the cavity, we could see all of the TV and radio stations, all of them. If I may just show, Maybe somewhere. So this is not like a Faraday cage. This is Faraday cage, but it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't help you. It's because it's again, it's the uh, the detection there is ten to uh, it's uh, is no minus hundred hundred twenty dB. Uh, That's the yeah. at this level you see everything. So this <laughs> these these are all TV and radio stations in Hamburg. <laughs> So that's the uh, that's what you see. You, you you see that all, but in in this cage, for um, for brass measurements, we don't have that because that's the this this whole room is shielded and it's shielded very well. So you don't see the radio here. There's no radio, but this is the uh, this kind of things. This is the spectrum essentially converted into sensitivity into exclusion units. But that's uh, that's how messy it is, and we have a whole procedure now in place, basically looking for for all those particular spikes, excluding them on different criteria, and then because we know that the signal from uh, a dark matter for us should be spread over many channels, mm. so we can just if it's not if it's just one channel, it's a clock. The clocks, the ten megahertz clock, is a nasty thing there as well. So you cannot get rid of that. It has to be there for, for many, many reasons. And it goes and just essentially pollutes a lot of a lot of the spectrum. But you have to just basically deal with that. Mm -hmm. I guess we need a laser group because uh, we need the very fine channels and uh, we need to a very good treatment of that. Well that we have, but then that's the and that's the 10 megahertz code which drives other things. But it has that, that signal, that signal is not as difficult to uh, Difficult to remove from this from the spectrum. It just that 
So this is a it's not an easy not an easy task, um, but we know how to deal with it. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Jean.